This is Ron Guttardi, Volunteer Director of the Oral History Program on the Battleship New Jersey. Today is Thursday, February 25th, 2016, and we're doing a Skype recording from Moorestown, New Jersey to Spicer, Minnesota. And the, at the other end is Wally Gustafson, uh, who's a World War II vet, and he's going to tell us about his uh, uh, experiences in the military. Good afternoon, Wally. Good afternoon, and thank you for the great work you're doing and recording these ancient events, because unless people like you do it, it's going to be lost forever. So I want to commend you for taking the time and the expending funds and whatever else to uh, visit with people like myself and others that have something to offer with reference to this World War II history. Thank you very much, Wally. I appreciate that. All right, Wally, let's talk about how old were you when you, uh, by the way, how old are you now? How old am I now? Yes. I'm 91 years old. Okay. And, uh, and how old were you when you entered the military? Well, I enlisted the Navy the day before I turned 18. I was in, in pre-law at the University of Minnesota, and I was advised by uh, my good friends and so on that if I would see a recruiter in the Navy and, uh, and sign up before I turned 18, I could finish my first year of pre-law and go to Naval Officers Training in an organization called the V-12 that was a uh, organization ordained by the Navy to uh, train and develop officers to become active duty officers after the completion of their uh, training course. And uh, the v V-12 program, as it was called, it uh, you had to sign up for wh what duration? For the war, uh, duration of the war? As I recall, uh, signed up for literally for the duration. I don't recall any uh, termination date. I know that I had to sign up to complete the naval training and uh, naval officer training and complete my duties as a naval officer. And before if, what... what uh... Was there a minimum obligation that you signed up for, a minimum number of years that you had to serve? As I recall, there was no minimum number of years. It was, that it was just uh, you serve until discharged. Okay. And what was the, 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 the date that you enlisted? I enlisted on January 20th, 1940, uh, wait a minute now, 43 the day before I turned 18, because <laughs> if I turned 18, uh, then I could not enter the officer training program. So I had my father come with me to Minneapolis to go to the recruiter's office and, uh, and so-called sign me in because uh, at age 17, I could not register for any military service. Okay, so uh, you signed up, and uh, when did you uh, ship out? To, uh, well, I've, training. I've, okay, I finished my first year of pre-law on uh, June 20th, 1943, and, and I signed out. Then the Navy, I went on active duty July 1st, 1943 at uh, Lawrence University in uh, Appleton, Wisconsin, which was one of the officers training uh, universities around the country. And I stayed there for 12 months and uh, fortunately passed all the tests. Then the Navy sent me to uh, Columbia University, which was called a midshipman school, for four months. I arrived there on about July 2nd, 1943. 44, 44. And I got my commission on October 26, 1944, at Columbia University. I got my commission as an ensign in the Navy. And well, there, why, the, why at Columbia University? Were you attending training there? Where? 
Why at Columbia University? That's where I spent four months in what they call midshipman school. Okay. Uh, and when I finished there on October 24th, 1944, I think it was, I got my commission as an instant officer of the United States Navy Reserve. Okay, and then where did you go from there? From there, the Navy sent me to Harvard University in Cambridge, Massachusetts uh, for uh, training in uh, naval communications. And I was there from uh, October, well, November 1, 1944 to about uh, January 1945 when I matriculated there and, and got my certificate as a uh, official naval communications officer in the Navy. Did you pick communications or did the Navy pick it for you? Uh, the Navy picked it for me. Uh, I assume they did some testing which said uh, you might be good at that. Well, I didn't have any choice as far as I knew. I was, when I was told I would be uh, assigned to Harvard, I <laughs> didn't want to turn that down, of course, and uh, that's where I went for, for four what? months. Okay. What do, what do you remember about your training, uh, either the uh, officer training school or the midshipman school? Anything memorable there? Well, I can tell you, <laughs> I was in Columbia University in, from July 1st to uh, October 24th, and I stayed, uh, as I, I was assigned and lived in John J. Hall on the 14th floor, no 12th floor, and I couldn't use the elevators. And if you're acquainted with the temperature of New York in July, August, September, it was just plain hot running up and down those stairways uh, from my room down to the classroom, whatever, about eight, 10 times a day. And I was a great- why, why couldn't you, do, you use the elevators? It was part of the training system. Oh. and. Uh, Okay. And the other, and it's the other part, part conditioning, was, I guess. Conditioning. Yeah, and the other part was the the discipline that was uh, rendered. I I, I got to share with you one interesting experience. Uh, every Saturday morning, they had what's called a room inspection, and an officer and two enlisted men would come in, and the officer had white gloves on, and they opened my drawers and looked at where if I had my stockings and underwear lined up just right and my shoes lined up in the right location and then my pants hanging in the closet and then he read his finger on top of the window or the uh, door jamb and of course there was about 25 years of dust up there and he put his, brought his, down his finger with a white glove on it and say what's this all about and uh, I guess I got about 10 demerits for that but uh, I never dreamed they would <laughs> be that picky about it. But uh, Saturday was a big day. That's when we had the inspection. And then we had a march outside and uh, go through all kinds of maneuvers. And uh, that was about it. We, we got off for Saturday evening. And uh, during those days, uh, Frank Sinatra was uh, singing and playing at the downtown whatever uh, venue it was, but those that are called a lucky strike hit parade. And every Saturday, there'd be a new list of songs that would be so called top 10 songs in the country. And of course, the top, the, the last one he was singing last, and uh, the place was just jammed and mostly with the. Uh, and we had special tickets on the chip, and we'd never gotten in, but uh, it was a very interesting event. Then on Sundays, of course, we all marched to church. Was uh, the uh, was the, the the Saturday night affair at the Paramount Theater by any chance? Which theater? Paramount. Well, I think you hit it on the head. I think so. Yeah, and uh, but he had a huge band there. It's called the Lucky Strike Hit Parade. Lucky Strike Cigarettes. It was probably broadcast on radio too, as well. I would think. Pardon me? Was it broadcast on radio, the show? Oh, I'm sure, because this was a, 
a big deal. Frank Sinatra was the number one, well, one of the great music celebrities at that time. And as I remember, my folks back home could listen to it on the radio. And uh, it was, it was the, the Lucky Strike Hit Parade was a national event every Saturday night. Okay, and then Sunday, uh, tell us about your Sundays. Well, then we all marched to church and had a good sermon at the Riverside, I think it's called a Riverside Presbyterian Church, or whatever it was, and uh, went to church. And uh, when he came out of church, we had a formation again. I they talked to back to our dormitory for a meal. And then we were kind of free to do one on a Sunday afternoon. But we had to get back, as I recall, on Sunday nights, we had to get back to our room by 6 o'clock. Okay, so what was your first duty assignment then? Well, when I finished Harvard uh, Communication School, I was sent out to, well, first of all, to Bremerton, Washington, to await further assignment. And after about a month there, I was sent to Pearl Harbor, to what they call the officer's pool. And there were about uh, 25, 30 Edisons uh, living at this uh, dormitory or facility in Pearl Harbor, waiting for an assignment somewhere in the Navy fleet. And when was this? This was, uh, what time of year was it? Well, it was, this is February 1945. Okay. And, uh, I got it. I got it. Hawaii before that? No, I never had. But what was your so, impressions? What were your impressions of Hawaii your first time there? Well, it was a lovely area, of course, and uh, uh, we were the Pearl Harbor on Oahu. <coughs> Excuse me. And we, my my colleagues or shipmates, we go shopping or whatever, swimming and whatever to kill time. We all waited for an assignment. So we were free to come and go as we wanted to for about two or three weeks. Okay, and then where were you assigned? Well, one Sunday morning, I think it was February 25th, uh, 1945, uh, I, I, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, headquarters said Ensign Gustafson Report to headquarters with all of your gear. Well, all of my gear, you can fit in two shopping bags, but so I went down to the desk and the man looked at me like I had won the Nobel Prize. He said, Gustafson, uh, Admiral Halsey has just appointed you to his staff. And he said, there's a Jeep out there waiting for you and uh, take your belongings with you and they're gonna take you over to where he's on what they call R&R &R at the time for about 10 days and I uh, got over there with, with a Doris Dukes uh, compound, which uh, Doris Duke, as you all know, is a, a tobacco heiress. So she had this spectacular home there in Oahu, pool and the house and all the rest of it, uh, guest house. And anyway, I got to the door and here this little man about six feet, six, came, no, six feet, five feet, six came to the door and said, Ensign Gustafson, uh, welcome aboard. The uniform of the day is swimming suit. I, he said, do you have one? I said, yes, I do. Well, he said, go over in this bedroom there and change and join the festivities, which I did, of course. And uh, it was it was quite uh, uh, interesting because I couldn't tell an admiral from a lieutenant because they're all walking around in bathing suits. And uh, I didn't want to stumble and make any mistakes, but... Anyway, about, uh, oh, I'd say this is like 11 o'clock in the morning. And uh, we just kind of walked around and visited and had some coffee or whatever. And then about 4 o'clock in the afternoon, I heard this wonderful piano music. And here was Eddie Duchin playing the piano in the one of the living rooms. And the word says, no, you gentlemen, you all got to go and change clothes because they're going to have a, a luau tonight. So uh, we got back in our clothes again, and it was a blessing for me. I could tell 
an admiral from a lieutenant, a vice admiral or commander or whatever. And then about 5.30 or so, a busload of nurses were, came over from the uh, Navy Hospital at Pearl Harbor to join the evening festivities. And they had this enormous luau where they had buried, you know, they bury a pig in the ground on, with palm uh, leaves and all that. And uh, and then A. Newton played for about two hours and uh, we had this marvelous dinner and drinks and all the rest of it. And it was really quite an exceptional evening. You were you were really uh, you What's that? doing doing your all for the war effort, I gather. <laughs> I was I was the <laughs> most junior officer there, and uh, and then the next day <clears throat> or next day or two, I forgot now. I was transported by a, a cruiser ship called the Miami from Pearl Harbor to Guam. Because that's where the battleship Missouri was uh, anchored for a week or two when the admiral had his R and R back in Hawaii. So I took uh, rode the there was aboard the Miami for I think it was three four days to get to the battleship Missouri, and that's where I finally found out what my duties were. And did you meet uh, Admiral Halsey then? Well, he. He came back. He was still in Hawaii. He flew. He flew back to Guam, of course. And uh, during for that time, we were all aboard the Missouri till the war ended. So we're talking about about March first until uh, the war ended on September second, nineteen forty-five, or the the signing of surrender occurred on September second, nineteen forty-five. The war actually ended about the middle of August after the bomb. They dropped the atomic bomb. <clears throat> that essentially, <clears throat> excuse me, ended the hostilities. But during on the Missouri, of course, the uh, the uh, admiral staff functioned as a unit. Uh, the other people on the Missouri call us excess baggage, but uh, every major ship has uh, uh, got to be a battleship or aircraft carrier has accommodations available for an admiral and his staff. And our staff was uh, officers of about 35 officers, probably 100 enlisted men. That's a good sized staff. Well, as you know, we were in, Halsey was in charge of the entire third fleet. And right, the third. I, I understand that his staff, all Halsey's staff was about twice the size of Spruances, who was also commander of the same fleet, but under the name Fifth Fleet, of course. Well, yeah, Third Fleet, uh, odd number like Third, Fifth, and Seventh are Pacific fleets, and the Second, Fourth, and Sixth were the Atlantic, as you well know. And you, the flag staff, of course, pushed uh, the. Uh, the Missouri's uh, officer staff into uh, doubling up in cabins. I, I would assume. Is that is that true? What's that again? Uh, in order to accommodate the flag staff, you had to the, the ship's officers, uh, the Missouri's officers, had to double up. Well, I don't know if they double up as such, uh, because the, the the facilities for the admiral staff was pretty much ordained and. Uh, we ate with the ship's officers, but uh, our rooms were separate from the other officers. And, uh, and of course, I had my office in a, we'll talk about that in a minute, uh, in, a, in a, a safe about the size of a, probably eight by 10. It was like a, a safe in a, in a bank because I had all the uh, coding devices in there. And we should talk a little bit about my, Assignment on the staff. Please do. My, my assignment was called a publications officer. And I, when I first saw it, I couldn't understand what in the world it was. I thought my job was to keep the Admiral with magazines like the Time magazine or whatever, but uh, I was dead wrong about that. Uh, my job was to keep track of the code. 
and and of course, as you well know, in peacetime and in wartime, and especially peacetime, all communications are by code, a five-letter code. And uh, the, the Third Fleet, the Admiral's Fleet, has its own coding room where about a dozen officers, uh, naval officers, ranking from ensign to lieutenant commander, uh, operating what they call the ECM, electric coding machine, that we could communicate with other ships in the fleet and the aircraft in the air and all that, because if we lost communications, we were in deep trouble. And my job was to make sure we had the code, the right code at the right time at the right hour. And uh, I get, I was awakened by my two, I had two Yoma as assistants, and uh, for, I'd be awakened sometimes at two, three o'clock in the morning. I said, Ensign Augustus, get up because uh, he just got a, a, a communication with the Pentagon that we got to change the code right now. So I get up and I got my, some clothes on and got the code changed for the people that run the ACM machines. Because, you know, we had hundreds of ships out there in the third fleet and we had all these aircraft in the air. And it was absolutely critical. We had communications at all times, and uh, that was my function. And how often did you change the code? Sometimes two, three, four, well, as high as five times a day. Whenever the Pentagon thought that the Japanese had compromised our code, we'd have to change it. Sometimes they wouldn't change it for a week, but sometimes three, four times a day because uh, but whatever the word came out that they thought we had Japanese that compromised our code, we had a work on it. I had a, I had charge of the code, and I knew which ones to, that would we use next. So a sequence of codes was pre-established. Pretty well established. Yep. Okay. And. Uh... Did you have a battle station as well as your uh, communications duties? Not really. Uh, my battle station was inside of my vault. It was like a, a bank vault, and when the alarm went off, I had to shut that door, and I was locked in there like you'd be locked into a bank vault because uh, if something happened, they didn't want those communication devices get in the hands of the enemy. So uh, that's where I spent. And they had, you know, uh, practicing or we were, thought we were getting bombed or whatever, which could happen twice, three times a day. Okay, and there were, there were no windows or ports uh, in the- Pardon in me? The vault. There were no windows or ports in the, in the room, in the vault. No, I've, not a bit, no, just a, an air vent, they got fresh air in, but no windows or anything. And I had to slam that door shut and that two big handle like you see in a back vault, to close it, lock it up. And uh, that's where I was stuck. Did you see any action while you were aboard the Missouri? Well, yes, we did. We, uh, we saw action basically when you start, we were, as you will, I was on the Missouri and we started bombarding Tokyo, and we were at Tokyo Bay there, uh, I forget, a week or so, and we were shelling it with these 16-inch uh, shells that travel about uh, 12, 15 miles, and uh, they were doing tremendous damage over there in, in the Tokyo area, and uh, yes, I saw that happen when these 16 gun mounts to go off the vacuum it was just horrendous. I was up on deck one day when they let go with about three of these, and I thought I was going to suck me right off the deck. It was just the the vacuum that was created by the the shells being delivered out of these 16 inch cannons was something. Your your communication station was on what level? Do you remember? Well, that's a good question. I think it was on the, it was on the same deck as the, as the mess room, and I think it was one deck above 
the so-called main deck. So it was uh, level 01? I guess you'd call it that, yes. Was that the same uh, level that the captain's cabin was? Was The what? The captain's cabin, was it on that level? Uh, you mean the, the admiral, you mean? Well, the captain's cabin, actually. Well, both the, on the New Jersey, which I'm familiar with, of course, which is very similar to the Missouri, the captain's cabin and the admiral's cabin are both on level 01. Is that the level you were on? No, I was one level below the captain and admiral's quarters. Okay. But that was still one level above the main deck. Yes. Okay, so the admiral and uh, captain's cabins were probably on a different level than uh, than on the New Jersey. Well, now we're talking about something 70 years ago, so I wouldn't want to say that uh, you're wrong and I'm right, but... Uh, okay. <laughs> Um, did, did you have any uh, contact with Admiral Halsey? Oh, I'm surely, absolutely. He was a very congenial sort of man. I wouldn't say we talked every day, but uh, he would stop by and and see what, you know, how things are going in my department, my, how the communications were going, working and had any problems that he should know about. And uh, I'd say he stopped by in my so-called vault office, where I spent most of my time, probably once a week. Okay. Just a courtesy, just a kind of a courtesy visit. But he was a very sociable man, and uh, and uh, I, what more can I say about it? Do you, uh, Halsey's a controversial character. Some people think he was a hero, and some people people think he was a bum. What what's your opinion? Well, everything I saw about him and learned about him when I was with him in the ship, Missouri, uh, uh, I would call him, a, label him a hero, and I could see nothing that would change my opinion about that. And uh, how he got the opinion of a bum, I don't know where that developed, but the fact is, the first I ever heard that. Okay, maybe bum is a little too strong a word to use there, right? They, uh, some people think he made some bad decisions. Well, I, I'm, sure, I'm sure that's true because uh, nobody is godlike or perfect, and uh, including admirals that run the fleet. And uh, and I have heard stories uh, that I can't. I was not there, so I shouldn't. I can't confirm it or deny it. Where he made some bad moves, and bad decisions, but of course hindsight is always twenty twenty vision. And uh, from my experience with him, uh, I always felt he was really on top of things and was doing what he thought best. Yeah, I'm sure that was the case. Were you uh, on board during the Typhoon Viper? Was that between February and I, I, went, we, I was out of Typhoon all right. And uh, I went through one Typhoon or different from a hurricane or a typhoon it's a, a, a quite an experience it's like if you want me to try to describe it it's like if you put a an egg in a big uh, bowl or bowl or not bowl but to to cook it and the, and the water is boiling and the egg is just kind of bouncing around that's what what it was like and i was absolutely amazed how these uh, destroyers and destroyer escorts could survive because you see them off in the distance and you see the mast and all of a sudden you see the keel and uh, and how they stayed afloat is a, just a wonderful thing. I know we had to, uh, we, we had to refuel some of these ships during that uh, typhoon and uh, that was a very risky business but they got the job done. They run a, as you know, a hose from our ship over to another ship, and, uh, and that's how that was done. Uh, had you heard about uh, Halsey's uh, prior experience with a typhoon in late 44? Had you heard about that at the time? I, I, I've heard about it since then, but I didn't know about, didn't know about it then. Okay, three, destroyer, three destroyers capsized during that typhoon. 
and uh, some people believe that Halsey made some bad decisions there. But well, uh, I, I I can't. I'm in no position to comment. Okay. Uh, did you know uh, Carney? Was Carney chief Ad of staff at that time? Oh gosh, yes! What a wonderful man, Admiral Carney, was chief of staff, and his assistant was Harold Stassen. Now you know. Little history there. Harold Stassen uh, was the governor of Minnesota, the youngest governor ever elected, and he resigned as governor and became Admiral Halsey's assistant chief of staff. So it was Halsey, Carney, and Stassen. Those were the top three. And Harold Stassen occupied a unique position because when they uh, began to think about enacting or creating or establishing the United Nations, uh, Harold Stassen, well, I should call him Commander Stassen, or Catholic Commander Stassen, was nominated to be the delegate from the United States to help craft the United Nations Charter in San Francisco. San Francisco. So he was back and forth off the ship, uh, well, I was going to say once a week, but that's probably stretching it. He, He'd uh, leave on a Monday by aircraft and he'd come back maybe in two weeks for a couple of days. And I know we're always glad to see him because he always brought the mail back with him. But uh, he was in San Francisco during this, my tenure. This was after the war was over, right? No, this is during the war. They were working on the... Uh... Oh, yes. Okay. They were crafting the United Nations Charter uh Long before the war ended, well, I say long, I know as long as I was on the battleship Missouri, which was in February 1945, uh, Harold Stassner was at that time back and forth to San Francisco helping craft the United Nations Charter. I think I have my history right. And what about Carney? Did he tell us about him? Well, he was a delightful person, a, a, a jolly guy, uh, uh, just a delightful person. I don't want he, he'd swing by too in my office at the bank vault, and he enjoyed talking about who I was and where I came from and and uh, wanted to know something about me and all the rest of it. He was just a, a, a person that you'd really enjoy visiting with that uh, at a party or wherever. He was a, a delightful person. And uh, I can't testify to his qualifications as a as a vice admiral, but I'm sure he wouldn't be on the admiral staff if he didn't fit the bill. But I have, not, have nothing but high praise for Admiral Carney. Did you, uh, did you get a... Uh Spend more time talking to Stassen because he was from your area of the country. Did I have any contact with him? Yeah. Yeah, a little bit because I was always had been uh, active in politics. Even when I was at the university, I was in the what's called the Young Republican League. So, and of course, he was a Republican, and uh, and we were about the only two officers from Minnesota. So we had a little bit of contact, not a great deal, but. Uh, he knew who I was, and I knew who he was, and, uh, and we'd say hello and how are things and all that, but uh, that's about the extent of it. And of course, after he uh, left the Navy, he made uh, a full-time job of running for president, didn't he? <laughs> yeah, he really kind of crashed and burned <laughs> in a lot of ways. He became, I think, president of the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, it was his first job, I think. And then he sought the uh, presidency more than once, and that was a total political disaster for him. And he became a lobbyist, as I understand, for uh, Lucky Strife cigarettes and travel worldwide <laughs> selling, or not selling, but you know, do whatever lobbyists do in the cigarettes. But, uh, uh, he really, when he ran for president, that was a mistake, and he should have stayed out of that field. 
He apparently made that mistake again and again over the years. He became yeah. a, a frequent. Uh, I don't know what motivates a, a distinguished man like former Governor Harold Stasson, Chief Assistant Chief of Staff to Nadbro, but President of the University of Pennsylvania to uh, make such a dreadful mistake. But uh, anyway, in my view, it was a mistake, and of course, it, it didn't. He was not successful in those in those efforts. Wally, did you was uh, Slew McCain part of the uh, Admiral staff at that time? Yes, he was. Oh, wait a minute, I'm talking about Admiral, Vice Admiral McCain. No, I'm, talk, no, I'm talking about Carney. Yeah, I know, but was Slew McCain was on Halsey's staff for part of the war, uh, on the flag staff? Was he on the Missouri with him? Not that I recall. Okay. I've got a picture of, uh, and I'm sure you have one too, of the Admiral Halsey staff aboard the Missouri. Have you got a copy of that? I'll, if you don't, I'll send it to you. I got some more pictures that I can send to you. That'd be great. Can you send them by email? Do you have uh, access to an email account? Well, uh, you're talking to a man that, uh, Harley knows how to dial a telephone, so I just I'll mail it to you. Okay. I'm just I'll just kidding you, but but I got to tell you another. I don't know whether you know this or not. You probably do, but it's an established fact of history that uh, after the bombing with uh, the atomic bomb and the, our our blasting away at Tokyo, the uh, that the admiral or the uh, uh, um, Hirohito wanted the war to end. And of course, he was a godlike image for that country. But the officers, the military officers, wanted to keep going. So uh, Hirohito had to figure out a way to get the uh, message to the Japanese uh, uh, radio stations to broadcast his message that he wanted the war to end and the officers were trying to steal it so the only way you get the the uh, the uh, tape so to speak of his message out of the his emperor's castle was in the bottom of a, a laundry bag and this is apparently the fact of history that that's what happened and uh but the military wanted to keep on, and he wanted to quit. And of course, he was, uh, you know, godlike in the eyes of the Japanese. And what's interesting about the, have you got a copy of the Instrument of Surrender? You got a copy of that? I'll send you one, too. Because okay. it's, it's signed by both Hirohito's representative and the military representative. That's interesting. That is interesting. Both. Both had a sign off. Uh, another fact of history, I mean, the war actually ended uh, about August, well, hostilities ended about August 15th. And we knew there were probably about 10,000 American prisoners in the prison camp just outside of Tokyo. And before the signing of surrender, Admiral Halsey commanded uh, Harold Stassen take charge of about three or four hospital ships and go over there and get those prisoners of war out of there and they had no problem even though they had to sign the surrender. And, um, and they got them all out? Got them all out, yep. And I got to tell you another story. We were uh, stationed just out of Yokosuka, which is the suburb of Tokyo. And uh, we were the officers, we, we, our group of officers, the Malsey staff, were the, actually the first men ashore uh, just poking around. So <laughs> the first day we went ashore, everything was by, was was uh, boarded up with plywood. You couldn't, there wasn't a single window open. But about the third day, because they had heard that the Americans were going to kill everybody. So they had barricaded everything, stores and homes and all that. 
But the third day, the, when the word got out, of course, that we were not there to do that, and a Japanese man came running over to us and shook our hands and spoke impeccable English. And we said, what, uh, what's your background? He said, I work for the Singer Shore Music Company. I worked on stage for 36 years, and I got caught over here when the war broke out. So he was glad to see us. Was the did you uh, the, the the Japanese naval base that was there was that uh, nearby? Yeah, it was, and I should tell you a story about that. I I'm not sure the name of the location, but uh, to show you how foolish young men like myself were at that time, probably still are. Uh, we 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 knew there were these caves, enormous caves, where the uh, Japanese naval officers lived. And of course, when the surrender was signed, they just abandoned the thing. So we went over there and got into these caves and uh, I found a pair of cufflings and one thing or another. But when I think back how crazy, crazy it was because they could have had those places uh, uh, with bomb time bombs and we'd all been blown out of the country, you know. But anyway, when you're 20 years old, that's what you do. Right. Uh, did you get did you get to st uh, spend any time at the Japanese naval base there there you know what the naval base the Japanese naval base well I think those those caves were part of the base I'm not sure I'm not that up to speed on the history but uh, I thought the caves were part of the overall Japanese naval base but it could be I'm not that familiar either I heard Halsey threw a big party there uh, celebrating the end of the war. Uh, were you part of that? No, but I recall the big party that Admiral Fraser, uh, the, the, the Admiral Fraser was the British Admiral, uh, the, the comparable to Admiral Halsey. And I forget whether it was before or after the signing of surrender, uh, Admiral Fraser invited the Admiral Halsey staff over to the King George V. That was the lead battleship for the British fleet. And we got over there and here's the symphony orchestra playing on a fantail, beautiful music. We're invited into the officers' quarters or, or state rooms or the uh, daddy room. And here was an open bar where they were serving liquor and a fireplace burning. And I couldn't believe it, you know, because on our ship, we there was no liquor, but there they had a bar set up, they could get free drinks, and we had a wonderful evening of festivities aboard the battleship, the British battleship King George V, which was the uh, head battleship or lead ship for the British in the Pacific. Yeah, I, I believe the British allowed drinking on all their Navy ships, uh, unlike the U.S., well, I was, you know, they, they had what's called a taut a rum a day. Uh, I happen to have a, 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 a cup that's called taut for rum. And I'm not sure it's true today, but I know it was true then. Right. But, 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 they, but they couldn't store it up for a week. They had to drink it or all forget it, you know. Okay, so after, uh, after the, now, can you tell us about the signing uh, aboard the Missouri, the, the Japanese surrender in September? Well, that was, of course, a major event, and uh, I happened to have a, a particular good spot. My, I had a, a five-inch um, gun mount on top of my office, so I got on top of that five-inch gun mount, which was about, 40 feet away from the signing table and all that. So I had a so-called ringside seat uh, for the whole ceremony. And uh, when the Japanese came aboard, there was no saluting, no shaking of hands, no waving, no music. They just, uh, General McCarthy pointed to the table over there and, uh, and the Japanese, I forget whether the representative Hirohito signed it first or the uh, military signed first, but anyway, it's on the document. And we, we signed last, and we had our 
16-inch guns aimed at Tokyo, just in case they change their mind or try to outsmart us or whatever. But uh, there was no joy expressed, no shaking of hands. They just uh, did their job and got off the ship. But, of course, after they left, and the reason it took uh, hostilities ended about, I would say, August 14th, somewhere there, and the signing was September 2nd, because all these officials wanted to be there. You know, it's a big event, so they had to wait for the uh, British uh, no, uh, dignitaries to get there, and the Canadian, and the Australian, and the Chinese, and the and, uh, French, to get them all there was quite a task. And uh, General McCarthy was, of course, in charge of all this. Oh, there's another sidelight to this I should tell you about. Uh, during the war, toward the end, uh, Admiral Halsey made the charge that when I, the war is over, I'm going to ride Emperor Hirohito's white horse down the main street of Tokyo. And that was publicized worldwide, and especially the American press. So when the hostilities ended, we started getting all these saddles aboard ship. And I'll bet with a week we had 15 saddles come uh, from various states in the country, and the best one that came from the state of Colorado with all silver stirrups and a beautiful thing. And uh, the stirrups uh, were from another one came from the Aleut Indians in Alaska, where they had taken, where they have these uh, buried walrus tusks that have been buried there for 100 years. They had made a pair of beautiful stirrups out of them. But we had all these darn saddles there and no place to put them except in the officer's dining room. And they took a lot of space, but that's the way it was. But uh, uh, General Arthur said, you're not going to ride that horse. And then we won the war. We don't want to embarrass the, uh, the Japanese people because Hirohito is our god figure. So you're not going to ride that horse. And that was the end of that. Okay, and you, after the the war ended and the peace was signed, you continued to serve on the Missouri until when, Wally? Uh, not very long, because uh, shortly after, and I'm not sure of the date of this, but in a matter of days after the surrender, uh, Admiral Halsey was replaced by Admiral Kingman, Howard F. Kingman. So we were... Uh, and, uh, and where Halsey, I think, went back to the States, I'm not sure about that, but anyway, Admiral Kingman took over as the third fleet commander, and the entire staff was transferred to the South Dakota. And we were transported from Tokyo Bay to San Francisco aboard the South Dakota. And I can still recall the afternoon, late afternoon, when we our, our ship from South Dakota led the fleet under the Golden Gate Bridge and the bridge was packed with people, bands were playing, and it was really quite a celebration. And that was been about, I suppose, a week or so after the signing of the surrender. Okay, and then, then what happened to you? Well, what happened to me next, of course, I mean, then I went with, with Admiral Kingman, Howard F. Kingman. And uh, most of the officers had enough points, to, you know, they had a point system to get out. So instead of having 40 officers, they were down to about eight. And uh, I didn't have enough points to get out, but I was so happy to be on the Admiral's staff. I wanted to stay there forever. So we finally ended up uh, uh, in Mare Island, which is about 40 miles north of San Francisco. We had a ship as a so-called headquarters. We never got there, never used it. We were on the, and the uh, based in the BOQ there at Bear Island, which was the place where they were uh, mothballing all these naval ships. And uh, since the Admiral was a bachelor and lonesome, he asked a few officers to 
to uh, eat with him, have dinner with him, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And believe it or not, he had uh, Secretary and say Navy Knox had retired, and his chef became Admiral Kingman's chef. So our meals were just spectacular, uh, including breakfast and lunch and dinner. And uh, once a week, or now about every other week, Admiral King would invite some celebrity from the West Coast to join us for dinner, like the head of the Ford plant on the East West Coast or uh, a lead uh, entrepreneur or somebody. So we always had interesting, at least once every two weeks, visitors to join us for dinner. And how long were, did you serve then on the uh, North Carolina? Well, I, I no, stayed sorry, there. North Dakota. Until, I stayed there until the last minute because I, I I talked to the Admiral about staying in the Navy. He said, well, in peacetime, uh, officers only stay with an Admiral staff for two years. So if you had other plans, uh, you better think about that because you're not going to be with an Admiral staff the rest of your days in the Navy. So I decided to go back home and go back to law school. So I stayed till the last day, <laughs> which I think was like August 28th of uh, 1946. And uh, I got uh, discharged in San Francisco and flew home and uh, got to law school about the same week. Uh, and that was the end of my naval career. And your law school was where, Columbia? No, Minnesota. Okay. I started free law at the University of Minnesota and returned to the University of Minnesota. I got my doctor of laws there and also a bachelor of administration, bachelor of business administration in 1950. And uh, did you uh, enter politics uh, soon thereafter or was it later? <laughs> Well, let's see, I got to think back, back on that. I, I started practicing law in 1951, and I moved to, uh, at one community, I moved to Wilmer, where I still practice, in 1956, and became active in the local Republican Party, and I ran for legislature in 1962, and was elected in in 62 and re-elected five times. I served in the legislature for 10 years. As a Republican in a heavily Democratic community. And they finally caught up to me in 1970 and elected a Democrat, which was fine. Was that the end of your political career then? That was the end of my political career in terms of office. I'm still interested in politics and watch it and, and uh, donate a few bucks and whatever else, but uh, I have not sought political office since. Uh, when did you get married? Uh, June 4th, 1955. 55. Well, my wife and I celebrated our 60th wedding anniversary last June 4th, and then she died in October 27th of last year from a heart attack. Sorry to hear that. Thank you. I wish you a hometown girl. Uh, Yes, she's a Wilmer girl, and uh, I met her, as a matter of fact, and uh, we got married in 55. I met her in, 40, in 1954 at a Republican, a young Republican convention in a city called St. Cloud, which is a city about 40 miles from here. That's where I met her. So we dated about a year. Looking back on your uh, naval career, uh, 
what had the most impact on you? Say that again, please. How did the how did your time in the military in the Navy impact your life? What did it how did it change you if if it did at all? Well, first of all, I, was, I think the Navy was extremely. I was blessed to be in the Navy. I'll put it that way. They sent me to school for got a commission, an officer when I was commissioned when I was what eighteen. And uh, what's the chance of being assigned to an admiral staff at age 20? Uh, I feel blessed in that area. Uh, I enjoyed my duty as a, aboard the battleship Missouri during the entire time being in charge of the communications network, which is, we all think our job is the most important one, but I, I think communications is one of them. And, uh, I felt I was blessed to be where I was and uh, uh, fortunate to be there when they signed the surrender and end the warfare, which is terrible. And uh, I don't know what more to say about it. Just out of curiosity, what field of law did you specialize in, if any, when you were practicing law? Well, I started out... Uh, was a law firm in a small town, uh, and I was, did a lot of trial work. I was in court almost constantly because the lawyer that I joined in in 1951 was a celebrated trial lawyer in Western Minnesota. So we had a, a, a really a, a great supply of cases, some good and some bad. And uh, Larum and my senior partner took the best ones and. <laughs> gave me and my associate uh, the, the dogs, as they call them. But we tried them and won a few and lost most of them. But we got a good experience in trying lawsuits, I can tell you that. And that bowled me well. And, uh, but then I got the legislature. So we, if you're going to be in the trial business, you got to be there almost every day. And when I was in the legislature, Although it was a part-time job, you just aren't, you can't fit a trial schedule into the legislative career. So I kind of lost my touch. So when I got through with legislature, I just didn't have any appetite to pick up the pieces and try to become a trial lawyer again. But fortunately, I, uh, we have a Minnesota called townships that you have them in New Jersey. I know that. Yes, we do. And I became the attorney for the Minnesota Association of Townships, served in that capacity as a part-time attorney for like from 1970 to 1990. And then also uh, I was uh, became the lobbyist for the township associations around the country in Washington, D.C. And that's where I learned about the townships in New Jersey and Pennsylvania and Illinois and and uh, Michigan and uh, now all states don't have townships. They start in North and South Dakota. We go to Minnesota, Wisconsin, Michigan, Ohio has them, uh, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and that's about it, I think. But I helped organize the National Association of Townships, so we had a had a full time. Uh, lobbyist out there, and I didn't want the job, of course, but we met in Chicago and got the board of directors of the states together and got the money together and uh, hired a lobbyist, and that's where it went. And I forget who your, your delegate was from New Jersey. Uh, it was, this goes back now, you understand, to oh, about 1975 or so. But I know very well that you have townships that. New Jersey. Yep, uh, the, the town I'm in uh, is a township. Township of okay. Morristown. Okay, and you're probably an officer there, huh? No. no. Uh, All right. Well, we're coming up on one hour, uh, Wally. 
Was there anything else that you uh, wanted to tell us about before we uh, close here? Well, I don't know. I feel blessed to have served the Navy, blessed to have be interviewed by you to preserve this for history. Uh, I have uh, not a history buff, but uh, uh, I put it together. This is an aside, by the way. My dad came from Sweden in 19 or 1892. As a 15-year-old immigrant boy with 25 cents in his pocket, one-way ticket, paid for by his uncle here. And uh, between 1890 and 1910, 20% of the population of Sweden immigrated to America because the, the poor were so poor over there they couldn't survive. And I've just finished off putting together kind of a, a family history of, of my dad coming over and uh, his nationalization, his coming to Ellis Island, uh, his work in the lumber camps and homesteading in North Dakota and marrying my mother back in 1911. And uh, another, I don't know how far you want to go with this thing, but... Uh, when I was in law school in 1950, I said, Father, you know, you got to go and visit Sweden one more time. You got a sister and brother over there, and uh, you hadn't seen them in 50 years. So I took the summer off, and I said, I'll pay my way. You pay your way. We'll go to Sweden. And we did. And gosh, we spent the whole summer over there, and I fell in love with the country. <laughs>